Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Simran and I'm a Canopy. Canopy is a co-working space that's based in San Francisco. Um, I'll add our link into the chat so you can check it out and book a tour if you want to come through. Um, so today's discussion is about how to use adaptogens to cope with modern stress and overstimulation. Um, and the talk is being moderated by Lauren Kaniko jones of, of Well in the West. Um, we will open this up to questions at the very end. So you can either type your question in the chat box or you can digitally raise your hand and um, I'll unmute you so you can ask your question. Um, okay, Rachel. Oh, sorry, Lauren, all you. Thanks, Simran. Um, I'm happy to be here and um, having this conversation with Rachel, Aaron, and Phil today. Um, so I'm gonna get us started. I'll give you just like a very, very quick intro to me and who I am, um, but mostly I'm gonna be asking the questions. So my name is Lauren Kaneko jones I've been a licensed acupuncturist for almost eight years um, in the state of California. And um, I currently practice in Berkeley, California at a practice called Mitchell Family Acupuncture. Um, I've learned a lot through my acupuncture practice um, about stress and stress management for people of all ages. And um, I also practice quite a bit of herbalism and I do teach some herb classes as well. So um, Well in the West is a project and a company that I've done and really based around seasonal health and teaching people how to navigate through the seasons of the year and seasons of life with various herbal tools, um, as well as lifestyle shifts. So that's me, but I'm mostly here to ask um, these people a bunch of great questions, but we'll kind of get everybody introduced and settle then, um, then we'll dive into the interview. So um, I'm just going to call on you guys because I think that's going to be the easiest way to do the panel. Um, so Aaron, you're kind of the first in my window. So if you could just introduce yourself and a little bit about what you're working on and what your title is. And then I'm also gonna ask if you have a favorite herb or method for managing stress. Ooh, okay. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Aaron Wilkins and um, I'm calling in from Herb Folk, which is an Asian American herb shop and clinic in Petaluma, California. So. Uh, kind of greater San Francisco Bay Area. And um, for the last 10 years, I've worked as a Japanese acupuncturist and uh, clinical Eastern herbalist. Um, I still do. So kind of a special focus on raw Chinese herbal decoctions, customized um, tea blends. And then from that practice, I've built out herb folk products and class offerings to honor that traditional knowledge and then also apply those kind of Eastern energetics to um, the products um, that I'm making using locally sourced herbs um, and things that grow in abundance in our area. And what is my favorite herb or method? I have to say, and I'm not saying this just because Rachel of Goldmine is here on the panel, <laughs> really every morning for the last few months I've been putting the gold mine adaptogen powder in my morning coffee and it's just so easy so but of those herbs I guess cordyceps and astragalus would be my favorites cool those are good ones especially for COVID life <laughs> yeah <Hopefully. sighs> thanks Erin glad you're here um Right, Rachel, curious to know a little bit more, just introduce yourself and you know what you're working on. And then if you have a favorite herb or method for managing stress. Yeah, so hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Rachel and I am a nutritionist, holistic chef, and I run and operate an all organic meal delivery service in San Francisco. And then also Goldmine, which um, Aaron pointed out is an adaptogen blend company. We sell a few different blends of adaptogens um, and they're all great. And I have to say that my favorite adaptogen has to be, or herb, it's not quite an adaptogen, is chaga. Chaga mushroom grows on birch trees in the Northern hemisphere. 
and was sort of like my introduction to medicinal mushrooms. And so um, just like where it grows, it turns into like a really black tea that's subtle and earthy and very mellow. And that's the vibe that I'm going for most days. And so that has to be my favorite. Cool. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, thank you. And Phil, can you introduce yourself hey and tell us a little about your work? And then if you have a favorite herb or method to manage stress? Of course. Uh, my name is Phil Magar. I'm a co-founder at Wonder. We're a San Francisco-based uh, cannabis beverage company. We make uh, low-dose cannabis beverages, cannabis-infused beverages that use Delta-8, Delta-9, eight, Delta Delta THC, and CBD. Um, and we just recently launched in San Francisco and LA in the last few months. Um, and I've been working with the cannabis plant for over 20 years as a cultivator um, and in retail and various other uh, parts of the industry. Um, and my favorite uh, herb besides, you know, the biggest, the most impactful thing has been swapping out our drinks for alcohol. Um, so using cannabis as a substitute for alcohol and going sort of Cali sober. Um, but beyond that, in the more traditional sense of adaptogens and herbs, I use uh, ashwagandha on a daily basis. And it's uh, been like a consistent friend throughout the pandemic. Uh, so that's my, my favorite for the last, for 2020, for sure. Cool. Ashwagandha is great. I don't, as a clinician, know the depth of it, but I know as a user that it's lovely. Cool. Thank you all. Um, so since we're, you know, really kind of focusing this panel on both adaptogenic herbs, which are so amazing, but also the effects of them, which is really about, um, you know, dealing and managing with stress. Stress is such a big word and it means different things to different people and probably means different things to each of you and all of us in different moments you know we can be stressed over I don't know running five minutes late to something or we can be stressed because we have this like enormous pile of life responsibilities and it's like you know slowly cr crushing us so stress has like a whole big spectrum um, I was kind of curious, and especially this year, I find that there's um, really in my clinical practice, I'm finding that people that are coming in are of the probably most well off um, in, in, at least in the Bay Area and also like in the pandemic still employed or like financially stable, but people are really, really struggling. The amount of stress this year is just so, so huge. Um, and I think everyone's kind of looking for reprieve. And so I was just kind of curious to ask you all um, if you could tell a story about a moment that you got stressed, um, you know, the mo modern world is stressful. It could be something really little or it could be something that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And, and what helped you? What did you use and how did you shift kind of at least out of the stress or at least to reduce it. Um, so I'm gonna ask this question to all the panelists. I don't think I'm gonna repeat it every single time, but um, do any of you want to start? You can unmute yourself or I can call on someone. Yeah, I'll go. Um, I won't share a specific story, but I think when I was thinking about how stress has impacted me. I think that our society has, um, you know, molded us to believe that everything has to be done immediately. And we are constantly having to multitask and we're constantly having to be available 24 seven. And I think that oftentimes when we're in that situation, our cortisol is pumping, our adrenaline is pumping. And we think that things have to be done that moment that things are dire. It's like a do or die moment. And I think coming to the realization that that's usually not the case. That's usually not really truly a reflection of the situation. And to, for me at least, it's been very powerful to give myself permission to take a moment, like maybe that's a day, 
maybe that's two days, maybe that's a full week. But if there's a big decision that I have to make, or if there's a situation where I don't have a clear answer on, or I don't feel one way or the other, giving yourself permission to take time to figure it out. I think that um, especially in 2020, it's so, and this year, you know, the fallout of 2020, I think that it's also intense. And on top of our personal lives and our work lives, we also have our, what's going on in the country. And I think that it's all very intense. And so giving yourself permission to not exactly know the answer to whatever situation you're confronted with and to say, okay, I see that. My knee-jerk reaction is to feel like this is a do or die moment and to realize like, okay, I'm just gonna give myself to the end of the day or till tomorrow. I'm just gonna think on it. And I think, or go on a walk or leave your computer. Just really give yourself permission to take space because oftentimes in that space, an answer will come or you'll realize, oh, that's not that important. I think we've all been in situations where either ourselves, our own expectation, our own internal voice, or someone external puts this pressure on us. And then how many of these situations, like a week later, it's still unresolved. And you're like, oh, a week ago, I thought this was like really, really acute and dire. And a week later, it's still, you know, unresolved because it unfolded the way it did. And we still don't have an answer. And I think that realizing that that's just the way life is. That is life. It unfolds how it will. And um, yeah, giving yourself permission to realize that and say like, okay, this is, no one's going to die. And if it is an acute situation, if so, if it is a traumatic acute emergency, then, you know, of course that that's a different situation, but most of the time it's, it's not, even though our brain makes us think it is. Cool. Rachel, I actually just want to follow up with you and this is sort of jumping a little bit to the next question. So I'll like hold for you and fill Aaron for a moment, but Rachel, is there anything like, I love that idea of space and I know like what I do and don't do to get myself space and I can feel it, you know, when I give it to myself and I can definitely feel it when I don't give it to myself and that the uh, sort of like the, um, snowball of like pressure that accumulates but what do you feel like you do maybe on a regular basis that helps give you that space yeah well when I'm in a situation where it feels like a do or die moment I think of something that actually you said which is do what you can no more no less and I think I use that I think of that statement often when I'm in a situation like that I feel that I'm overstretching myself or if someone is asking me of something, I ask myself that, okay, what can I do? No more, no less. Am I overstretching myself or is that I, do I just have a friction because I have like, I have some attitude with this person and I actually can do what they're requesting me to do. And I think that on a regular basis for me, what has made the most impact is meditation and, and movement. And of course, adaptogens, I think adaptogens have like a very, uh, as all of those things do, a very like physical response and impact in the body. But meditation has been very impactful because we're so overstimulated all the time. And there's not many moments in the day or throughout the day that we can just be in silence. And there's that moment. And I think oftentimes what happens is that people feel, or at least I can speak in my own experience, is that you might feel pulled in a million directions or really vague about how you feel about something or just like really just confused, like all oh, these people are, are, are giving me this input or my internal voice is telling me to do something. But if you sit in silence, I have found that the answer comes and I can actually parse through all those different things to what I actually feel or what I actually want. Um, so for me, meditation has probably been the most impact to deal with 
overstimulation and stress. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, it's important to like create time and space, right? I have to say like so many of my patients are women, which is like the majority of most acupuncture practices, but so many of them are mamas and <laughs> mamas are stressed out right now. Um, and that's sort of the biggest thing that people need is like, you know, they're coming to me for the physical act of acupuncture and how amazing that can help shift things. But they're also just like coming for a little bit of space and to not be on duty like the second they wake up from the acupuncture nap. Um, so yeah, just like whatever you can do. I love that to give yourself a little bit more space is awesome. And meditation is just obviously such a steadfast practice for a reason. Cool. Um, all right. So let's go back to this kind of like, if you can tell a quick story about a moment you got stressed and what you did to help shift things. Um, Phil, are you ready to answer that question? Sure. I also, I mean, I don't know if there's a specific story, but um, I spent 20 years in cannabis. So every day was pretty stressful for me. Um, and so I built up quite an arsenal of uh, techniques and practices. I have like a deep meditation practice. I work with master herbalists and healers, energy healers on a regular basis. Um, and I would say, I always look at like, foundational elements. So I look at sleep. Am I sleeping? Am I sleeping early enough, like at, at 10 p.m. or 9.30 or 10 to get deep sleep? And um, am I exercising? Am I eating healthy? Am I getting daily meditation? Um, and if I'm not getting those, I'll t try and focus on them. They're free, first of all, um, and they tend to work the best. And if you don't have those fundamental building blocks, um, you know, you can dump adaptogens, you can dump products on top of um, a bad foundation, but um, generally speaking, I've found that those, those tend to work the best. Um, and then the other thing on a personal note that maybe some of you can relate to is that I realized this, I, it took me a long time to realize this. It took me, I'm 43 and I just realized this really last year, which was that um, on a daily basis, I had one foot on the gas and one foot on the brakes. And it wasn't always at the same time, but often it was. So I would get up in the morning, I would drink coffee, and then I would drink tea or something else, yerba mate, I would have like stimulate myself to get up in the morning, um, often overstimulate myself. And then at night to cope with stress, I'd drink alcohol. And um, that was sort of the, the, the genesis of, of Wonder, the company that, that uh, myself and my two co-founders, Lexi and Christian created was like, we all realized that we had this unhealthy relationship throughout the day, right? With stimulants and, and alcohol. And so to really just look at that objectively and face it was, was a real powerful moment for me. And I gave up most, I'm Cali sober, whatever that, whatever that means. I think that's, that means that you do some psychedelics or you do, uh, you do some cannabis. Um, and it just means you're flexible. Like I'm not totally sober. Um, I'll have a glass of wine every once in a while, but for the most part, it meant sort of re-engaging with how I consume things and how I'm sort of on this roller coaster. And that has made such an impact on my mental health and how I feel throughout the day. And it's improved the things that I was doing, the meditation, the fasting, all these other things have gotten exponentially better by cutting back dramatically on caffeine. I cut out coffee and I've mostly, you know, I've cut out probably 95, 90 or 95% of the alcohol. I used to literally drink alcohol every night um, and I've stopped that and it improved my sleep. You know, within like a week, my sleep score went up tremendously. I tracked my sleep, my deep sleep increased um, and my meditation practice completely changed. After 20 years, I feel like I truly have like, uh, like the intimacy of my meditation practice has completely gone through the roof. Like it's, it's gone to areas that I could not have never have imagined. So. I would encourage people to focus on the things that are free and available to you that you do every day, you know? Um, so I hope that's helpful. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like you kind of answered my second question of what you do on a regular basis to like keep the calm. I have a, another question that I'm like thinking of to add in for you guys, but um, for you to think on. Um, but Erin, I'm going to have you answer if you could tell a story um, or maybe just a general answer about like what happens for you when you get stressed and what helps support you get out of that. Hey, yeah. So short story is I'm a working mom, which you touched on Lauren. Um, and so and my kids are at home distance learning. So that whole scenario is very stressful, but thinking back to last summer, um, also as a small business owner, a few months into quarantine, it was one of the more stressful moments of my life to this point. And um, the racial justice uprisings, like there was so much going on. I felt very overstimulated and nowhere to go. No, no, you know, all of my usual coping mechanisms were out the door. And so what I did in that, during that time was I just stopped. I didn't try and figure out the perfect herbal protocol. I didn't order a bunch of supplements. You know, I, I just, I stopped going on social media for a hot minute. I stopped answering emails, stopped looking at voicemails. And I just, um, went inward and spent a lot of time outside. Um, and, um, coming out of that, I, it's just like a fresh perspective, right? And this is really just echoing also what everybody else was saying is just taking a moment to just pause and reassess. And, um, and so, yeah, that was, that created a, a big shift in my life and I'm trying to kind of carry some of those lessons on even now as like the world starts to return to you know, like busy norm again, um, just doing less day to day. Cool. Erin, I'm going to stick with you, but I'm kind of curious and like something that I think especially both you and Phil have touched on are like things that you've cut back on or cut out of your life. So like, you know, um, I think a lot of, of the thoughts are like, okay, what can people do to help support? And a lot of the wellness conversations are like, what can you add in like supplement wise or activity wise to help. Um, and I do want to, I want to get there, but maybe we need to talk about like cutting things out first. So I know for myself, um, I'm also a mama and I have a toddler and, you know, the first 40 days postpartum is this really tender, um, very receptive, like sensitive place to be. And I remember, and I can't remember if I did this before he was born or if I did it like in the first week after he was born, but I deleted Instagram, which was like sort of the one social media that I check on a regular basis. Um, and I just let myself be in the world that I was in, which was like my bedroom with a tiny child. Um, so I'm curious, you know, like hearing both of you um, talk about things that you cut out, like yeah, like, do you feel like that's a go-to or are there things that you notice when you're overstimulated that you just like, you have to get rid of? And maybe this will be a little bit of a repeat of what we talked about, but I'm curious if you can like put a finger on those things. So Erin, go ahead. Yeah, what comes to mind, what came out of that time of just doing less was I realized, similar to what Phil was touching on, that I was drinking a lot of caffeine, a lot of coffee. I was taking a lot of supplements and I wasn't really feeling things anymore. I was kind of just doing right. And so taking a moment and kind of reflecting and feeling things again, I realized, wow, like I don't need maybe like this, like I was taking this really strong tincture. I was like, I don't need that. I can just take tea right? Um, or I can add herbs to my food, which is really the direction that um, I've personally been moving in. And then also for my business is food is medicine. Um, I don't know if that answers the question as it comes to mind. Yeah, I think you're talking about taking away like, I mean, you are a clinician, but in some ways like the, the pharmacy 
and just like having it be really simple. Okay, cool. Um, Rachel, do you have anything that you feel like you take out kind of like in speaking about this overstimulation and just how busy the world is that you take out that helps um, kind of shift things? Yeah, I mean, I echo what Aaron and Phil was saying. I mean, sometimes when we're overstimulated, we want to add more to the plate. And I think that there's this concept of a silver bullet, like, oh, if I only buy this it'll cure my whatever I'm, I'm trying to fill. And oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, it's actually a pattern of avoidance. What do I want to cover up? And I think that when we remove the caffeine, when we, when we remove the alcohol or whatever the vice might be, and it might be as simple as social media, when we take that away, then what do we fill the space with? What do we fill our mind with? What do we fill our time with? What do we fill our bodies with? And I think that's where the magic happens. So then when we remove, we actually are creating a lot of space for us to recreate something. If we're feeling unhappy or not satisfied, I think that it's easy to go to whatever that is. It might be TV. And when we remove that, we actually have to ask like, okay, what is going on? Or how do I feel? Or what do I want to do with my time? I think that those are really important questions and, and sometimes scary questions because we might have grown up in a family that avoids and we might be have, have trained to be, to act like that or to think that that is acceptable or that's just the way life is. And so I think when you remove it actually is where the magic happens. Cool. Bill, do you have anything to add of like, you mean you kind of mentioned things that you took off your Yeah, I love both. I love both Aaron and Rachel's answers, by the way, and they totally resonate. Um, just the, I know this is a talk about adaptogens, you know, using things to, um, you know, adapt to stressful situations or life experiences. Um, I think one other thing that I'll add is that, you know, as, as Rachel was saying, which is like this break, both um, this idea that that's become fairly common uh, in the last few years or the last five years, whatever it is, which is fasting. And that can mean, you know, however you want to use that, right? Which is like just taking a break from things. Um, and I've done a lot of fat, you know, prolonged water fasts and, and then social media fasts. Not, I'm not, I'm not as great as a social media fast, but I've done, um, uh, you know, I've tried to eliminate certain things, getting off Facebook um, and not checking it and removing apps. Um, and, um, and I think for me, what was most profound physically was, was doing prolonged water fasting. And you just realize your relationship with hunger, your relationship, like how mental consumption is, how mental uh, that real hunger doesn't really exist within a single day often you know it's like it can if once you go five days or seven days without food and just water you realize wow like most of that was in my head and it can sound when you first hear it it can sound sort of crazy and sound like what are you talking about you're not eating for that long but the body physiologically um you know it's very it's a, we're, we're very powerful um creatures and um it taught me a lot about what what hunger was and my, how my mind worked, you know, how my mind tricked myself into, um, and it also wiped out a lot of cravings as well. So things like sugar and sugar, alcohol, caffeine, when you take those away and you just are left with your body and water. Um, yeah, it was just, kind of, I think, I think that's something that, um, I think it's a powerful tool for people, um, to sort of reset and, and look at their relationship with the world. And can I add one more thing? Yes, please. When I was thinking about stress management, I think sometimes also it's an attitude or a perspective or things that we're repeating to ourselves. And so, you know, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. And if you're repeating that all, or I'm struggling, or I'm so busy, I can't handle it. I think that sometimes it's as powerful and it's, you know, what Phil was mentioning, these free things that, you know, the wellness 
market is oversaturated. So what can you do for free, which is you can shift an attitude and like, I have this list of things that I have to get done today and what's realistic, what can I get done and what can get done on a different day so that I don't feel, um, the vice or the pressure to get all of it done and get overwhelmed and maybe not be present with each task or, you know, run myself into the ground or, or, you know, not be able to drink water or, or feed myself or get out for a walk or something like that. Um, so I think the mind can also, what Phil was mentioning, it, it can be a very powerful thing that if we're repeating these negative affirmations, that can also have a, a trickle down effect. And, you know, not even talking about the nervous system, which, you know, if we're constantly in this fight or flight mode, then we're not able to rest and digest. And also when we're not able to rest and, and digest and rebuild and restore, then we're not in a clear mind. And so I think that that's where, you know, some of these vices come in, or that's where things feel really overwhelming and stressed out because our body literally hasn't had the time to restore and relax and rejuvenate itself so that we can be more resilient. Totally. Well, I think, you know, one of the questions I had and while we're kind of on this topic of cutting things out, like what are, what are things that you feel like we as consumers should be cautious of in this very saturated on this market of products and services? Like, how do you guys choose we are going to get to kind of adaptogens and and like what you do actually choose so that's kind of the follow-up but like how do you make decisions before you like share you know exactly what brand and what things you like to include on a regular basis do you have any general rules for yourself or you know what turns you off of something and you know that like this is just sort of gimmicky and trendy or like what what lets you know this is really like a legitimate product that you should, that you're really interested in and feels like the right thing for you. Rachel, do you feel like- I can go, oh. I can go. Um, so I'm not an expert in adaptogen, so I'll speak about uh, cannabis and CBD. CBD is probably the thing that most people have access to that they're using and CBD is sort of like full of landmines um, as far as like what's real, it's highly unregulated. Um, and so a quick and dirty rule is like, look for the, the real quick and dirty thing before I get to the, the actual quick and dirty is I, I find that when a founder is willing to be public, they're willing to speak to an audience when they're willing to engage with you. If they're not willing to do that, that's to me is a red flag. And I take I, like if I'm going to consume something, especially this is important as either an adaptogen or something that's really helping me for my health and wellness, I want to, I want to know who's behind the product. I want to know who the farmer is. I want to know who the formulator is and don't be shy. Like I reach out to people all the time and you'll be shocked. Like on LinkedIn, uh, follow people on Instagram and that to me is the best way of shortcutting to finding authentic products and products that are well-made like founders that are bullshit artists, pardon my language, they, they hide, they don't put themselves out there. And so um, that's the super shortcut And within the CBD world beyond that. I think if you get that, you're probably going to not need the rest of what I, what I, what I'm saying, because they're all hiding, but um you know, for CBD and CB and hemp products in general, it's, it's expanding beyond CBD. Now you're going to have other compounds that are being bred, but for hemp products in general, I look for um, regenerative agriculture, organic, you know, grown in the U S hemp itself is a uh, bioremediator, which means it pulls toxins out of the soil. So of all the products, you really do not want to be consuming inorganic uh, hemp products or CBD. So, um, and then look for fillers and, and stuff, you know, people are, are, people can really put whatever they want. It's similar to wine. Like there's very few rules about what you can do. Um, and there's a lot of additives you can have and, and less is more when it comes to hemp. So cold pressed, cold processed, uh, CBD is a great way to start. And then, you know, look for, look for owners who care and, 
who are doing things the right way. Um, that's that's what I would add for CBD. Great, thank you, Rachel. Do you have any guidelines? Yeah. So I think whenever you're consuming anything, especially an herb, it's always good to um, work with somebody that knows herbs and can recommend things for you and what you are going through. We're all so different in what we need. And I think that what's good for one person is, is not a good fit for the other. Um, and I want to add one more thing before I, I go into adaptogens is nutrient deficiencies. I think just as Phil was saying, you know, are you sleeping well? Are you eating well? I think nutrients are also really important. Um, you know, sometimes depression can be a result of a zinc deficiency and zinc deficiency is very common. Magnesium deficiency is very common. Vitamin D is very common and very crucial for us in the COVID era it's really important to have ample amounts of vitamin D and vitamin C in our diet. So I think it's these simple things that are like these building blocks to then get to these really yummy add-ons that take you to the next level and sort of like get you to where you want to get. Um, unless you're working with an herbalist or an acupuncturist that can say, okay, let's get you a therapeutic dose of this herb to help you detox or rebuild or what what whatnot. Um, so I think always working with a trusted practitioner that knows the space is a great way to start. I'm sure Aaron and Lauren would attest to that. Um, and in terms of adaptogens and quality, transparency is key, making sure that you know where the herbs are grown making sure that they're grown organically. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're certified organic, but um, because being certified organic is very expensive and not all farmers, even if a farmer is growing organically, it doesn't mean that they, they have the money to pay the USDA to get certified. It's very expensive. Um, so, you know, quality, transparency, and potency, you know, how the herbs are grown, when the herbs are harvested, how they're processed, that's all a part of the equation. Um, you know, there's a difference between dried reishi mushroom that's ground into a powder and a reishi mushroom that's grown outdoors, sun-dried, water, extract, hot water extracted, then turned into a powder. So you know, it depends on the herb, but for example, medicinal mushrooms need to be processed. Actually, your white button mushroom needs to be processed too. It needs to be cooked. Um, it's not great to consume raw mushrooms. And so I'll leave it at that. I think Aaron, I'll, I'll leave space for Aaron. No, I mean, y'all touch on all the points that I had really at the forefront of my mind. So we can keep the show rolling. That's great. Erin, maybe we can start with you. You know, we talked a lot about, um, you know, what y'all have cut out of your lives and things that you, you sometimes do if you feel the need and feel overstimulated and what we should be like wary of. What is worth it to you or what are things that you do pay for and you do integrate into your life? Um, even we're keeping it simple. Um, I try to keep it simple for patients as a practitioner, um, but I definitely have a lot of things that I do, like definitely have as guideposts in my physical practices between supplements and I get body work and um, go see my own healer so that I'm tuned up for, to be you know in good shape to take care of other people. So yeah, I'm kind of curious, like what are things that you do for yourself? some notes to keep me on track. Well, um, the, the, probably the biggest product that I spend money on for myself would be mushroom products. For the reasons that Rachel just touched on, they need to be processed and extracted properly. Um, and so, and I prefer to take mushrooms as a powder, like the gold mine powder, um, 
because it just easily can blend into my daily coffee, my daily tea lattes, smoothies, um, and just the ease of use there is just so important for me and like for my really busy lifestyle. So <clears throat> mushroom and adaptogen powders, number one. I also, within my work and then personally, spend a lot of money on locally sourced herbs and produce from CSAs and um, local growers um, for the quality, of course, also carbon footprints and just really wanting to support these like small local economies that we have going on. Being in the Bay Area, we have access to just so much. Um, so it's, it's a joy and a privilege to, to um, support local. Um, in my former life, I was pre-law and I worked in these different law firms. And so I actually did see some studies on heavy metals and pesticides in herbs. Oftentimes we think, oh, that's Chinese herbs. The Chinese herbs are dirty. No, it, it's the soil quality. So if you're getting herbs overseas, whether it's hemp, Chinese herbs, Western type herbs, they can be dirty. And so that's, um, so transparency is important when we are sourcing overseas. And then when we have the ability um, to source locally, it's again, such a privilege. So that, and then the, the final thing of the services, Lauren, yes, like paying other practitioners so that we can receive healing treatments, whether that's acupuncture, massage, therapy. Therapy is probably my biggest expense right now. It's just um, get so much out of that. Cool, yeah, important, important to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of our families and communities and do the work that we want to do in the world. What about you, Rachel or Phil? I'll go ahead. Um, you know, I think when I first discovered adaptogens, I was in a place of, of immense burnout and I was so lethargic and I just didn't have the energy. And that's when I started playing with adaptions and brewing tea concoctions and exploring powders. And, you know, adaptions have made a huge impact on my life. And it goes back to even the attitude that I was mentioning before to, I have a busy day, like I can do it. I, like I got this. And adaptogens, how they work in the body is that they support your, your pituitary adrenal thyroid connection, which is your HPA axis, which is basically the system in your body that regulates homeostasis and, and takes in stimuli from the environment and tells your body like, what's up? Like, should we be scared right now? Are we safe right now? What's up? And so through the system, your body is trying to always create balance and homeostasis and adaptogens help to regulate that response and not function on a cellular level. So if you're too lethargic, it'll bring you up. If you're too hyped up, it'll bring you down. And so I think adaptogens can play a really important role when, you know, we can be confused, like, okay, I'm getting sleep, I'm eating well, like, what's up? Like, why don't I feel as good as I think I should? And so I would say, you know, do research, see what, you know, interests you or what herb you're drawn towards. Um, for me, that's been a blend. So for me, that's how Goldmine started, which was five adaptogens, Rishi, Chaga, Cordyceps, Astragalus, and Ashwagandha, and Rosehip for vitamin C for that mushroom potency. Um, and that's, you know, that's where it started. And, and literally in your nervous system, like, adaptogens help your body to respond to situations where you're not like triggered in this fight or flight mode so easily. So it actually, what happens when you are in or you're in a challenging situation is that you're, you're more present. Your frontal cortex, when you're, when you're in acute triggered situation, your frontal cortex, which is like your decision-making dims down. And so you're like survival. And so adaptogens help you in this keep stay in this rest and digest mode. And so you're able to stay more present and people are like, oh, I feel more space. I feel more present. And that, it, yeah, it, it started with me needing, needing that and wanting that. 
So that's adaptogens, but also everyone is different. Like for me, it's acupuncture. Like acupuncture is that service that I pay for and I reap a lot of benefit from. Um, and, you know, using these daily rituals as check-in moments. I think that's what it's all about. You know, it's all about like, how do I feel? What's going on? Am I in alignment? Am I doing what I want to be doing? Am I in alignment? And I think that all these things are like checkpoints for us to confirm yes, or maybe no. Totally, such a puzzle, right? <laughs> Uh, Phil, do you have anything to add? Like what, what are things that you do feel like are really worth it to you to pay for and spend time and money on to help keep you going? Yeah, I've got like a, I've got like a race car team supporting me. <laughs> um, so I use all kinds of, uh, I know it feels crazy. I've got like people, I've got like energy healers that work on me remotely at this point. I've got um, a master herbologist that I consult with regularly. Um, and I'm seeing in the comments, someone's mentioning, mentioning exercise. Exercise is something that I haven't done recently where I've had like an outside coach, but I've had in the past I've, I've worked has been really beneficial to have someone um, doing like Bagua training, Tai Chi, Qigong. Um, really like once you get, the more you go down this sort of rabbit hole of, um, you know, once you start removing these things, your body becomes more sensitive and your energy system becomes sensitive. And it becomes really important to have great habits and also great teachers and practitioners around you because your sensitivity means that like, you know, the wind blows and you're like, ah, <laughs> you know, it's like little things, uh, little stressors can have a pretty disruptive effect on you. And so it becomes the more important, it becomes more and more important to really um, keep the machinery fine tuned. Um, so yeah, I've, I'm like every week I, I use, usually have like three hour consultations, separate consultations with someone who's monitoring, uh, energy, doing healing work or, um, you know, keeping my herb, uh, and tonic, uh, regime going well. Um, and I love, yeah, what both Aaron and Rachel said was great as far as like, um, you know, the, it's all personal to you. So whatever adaptogen that you find called to, and I would just say that it's really important that people develop their intuition with their body and learning like what's a yes and what's a no for them, because everyone's unique. You know, Rachel said this earlier in the conversation, every, every single body, every person, every, everyone's experience in the present moment is unique, right? You have, we all have different stressors. You know, some people have kids, some people don't. Um, some people have financial troubles right now because of the pandemic. Um, and so you're a unique constellation of circumstance. And it's really important, given that, that you treat yourself as, um, you know, that little snowflake that you are. And, um, you know, for, for some person, ashwagandha might be great. For someone else, it may be, it may not work for you. Um, and the dosing, right? Dosing. I think really when you're taking things, don't just mind, mindlessly take things and hope that they're going to work. Really, I think um, I would encourage everyone to become like an explorer of themselves, of their own body, psyche, what works, what doesn't work. And I think then when you run into something, you get better at calibrating against a product or a regime uh, or a teacher, right? Not every teacher is going to work for you. You know, I've, I've brought people to my, my meditation teacher's classes and they run out of the room. It's a super potent room. It's not for everyone, right? Um, and so, you know, you've got to treat yourself with the respect that, that your experience is the most ex important experience. Your experience matters more than anyone else's word. And that goes when you go to, you know, when you go to pick up uh, an adaptogen plan, if you go get, you know, one of, one of Rachel's products or, you know, if you're at Aaron's store picking up something, um, really listening to yourself and checking in and figuring out how you find your yes or no, because everyone's a little bit different there too. But um, I think that's been a very big shift for me is like becoming your own inner authority and listening to it when you pick out products. Thank you, everybody. So I think we're going to try to open it up to questions. Simran, are you 
You're muted. I'm muted. There we go. Yeah, so we can open this up to questions now. So if anyone has any questions, go ahead and digitally raise your hand and I can unmute you. Or you can just pop it in the chat box. Um, so if we don't have any yet, so are there any other questions that you had um, uh, to ask the panelists? Yes, I do have more questions. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for sharing that. And I think, you know, this, this conversation about like, what to take away to then decide what to add in is so important. And yeah, it's, it's sort of that simple in a way, especially the taking away part. And then I liked, it was just nice to hear everybody's responses about what they do add in and what they do um, for support, because they think that we can't do it alone. And if we have the means like paying other people to help take care of us is really, really important. Um, we actually do have a question. Oh, great. It came up. So Gail, I'm going to unmute you, Gail. Um, you can go ahead and, and ask, ask away. Sorry, you can't see my face because I'm eating my lunch, but a late lunch. Wow. Um, I just had a question about someone mentioned, I think Rachel mentioned that raw mushrooms are not healthy to eat. Is that with all mushrooms or is it that they're not as healthy or they're just not plain not healthy to eat? Yeah, so raw mushrooms, uh, they can be toxic to consume raw. So it is, it's important to consume cooked mushrooms. <laughs> Even the white, bush, white button uh, portobello mushrooms that you can get at the grocery store, it's really important. Um, mushrooms need two things. They need to be extracted or, or cooked and they need a source of vitamin C. It's just like turmeric needs black pepper to be absorbed to, you know, the, the fullest degree. Well, thank and you. I want to say, uh, I also want to mention Tulsi. Tulsi is great. I would say like a low tech way for those who are new to adaptogens or herbs um, to introduce themselves is through tea. So Tulsi is a, a wonderful adaptogen. It's great, has mild antidepressant um, effects. It's really a wonderful herb and you know even making a chaga tea or a reishi mushroom tea or a rhodiola tea I think that is a really nice way to kind of introduce yourself to these herbs if you're interested. Tulsi is very delicious also. Thank you for that I didn't know that about the mushrooms and yeah Tulsi helps me every time it always takes the edge off. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel do you have, do you have ideas on adding uh, vitamin C, because I take a mushroom powder every morning, pretty much. Like I, I make a tea out of it, like a 14 mushroom blend, but I haven't been adding vitamin C. Um, and I, I will now, but do you have ideas on like the best way to do it? Yeah, I mean, it could be as simple as um, like taking your mushroom tea and then, you know, eating blanched kale for lunch or like, you know, it doesn't, um, it's, I'm trying to think of like another, in our immunity blend, we have lucuma, which is a Peruvian fruit sort of sweet, and that's the vitamin C. So there's, I can't think of one right now, but there's probably some other herb that you can add that has a natural source of vitamin C. Maybe Aaron or Lauren knows. I mean, in Chinese medicine, we're always adding citrus peels to any, everything. So that's what comes to mind. And then like you were saying, Rachel, it doesn't necessarily have to be, it could be a tangerine peel in your teapot, but it also could just be in, in your food. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a question uh, from Jen, which is what are some resources that you recommend to learn more about adaptogens? The internet. Um, there are some, there's also, um, a wonderful book, Let's see if I can, I don't know if Aaron or, Aaron or Lauren have another source, but there's some wonderful books out there that I'll pull up and I'll, I'll um, put in the chat. And then we have another question from Sarah. Um, as you see big food companies getting, um, getting more into the functional food space also, 
and then they can't necessarily have the fully transparent founder story like you advised. What is your advice as to how to assess who's providing quality products over there? I mean, my short answer is buy small and buy local, but um, beyond that, just ask them to be transparent. I mean, if they're not willing to be transparent, there's usually a good reason for it. And so you have to think about what you're putting in your body. And if this is for health and they're not willing to be transparent, I, to me, that's just a, a non-starter. Does anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, echoing Phil, you know, this is something I was going to say earlier is, of course, buying local for so many reasons, because um, in the end, I don't want to be buying Amazon adapted gym powder or Walmart cannabis like that's not. I think that's not where that's not that's not it, but with a bigger company they they do have to be more transparent they do have to have testing and um, they can afford things like labeling like organic fair trade so those are some things to look for i'll add one more thing on the cbd side there's uh what's called the coa which is a certificate of analysis and you can look up you know that's one way like responsible brands will have those and it publishes and it'll have heavy metal content it'll have pesticide you have to, I mean, we use that in cannabis all the time. Like you get the COA before you talk about anything else about what you're sourcing. So something else to ask for or look for. Thank you. Um, right, we have time for one more question. And this one is from Sophia. And her question is, could you give adaptogens to children? And if so, which ones would you recommend? So I work with kids um, in my practice and Erin could probably speak to this as well. Um, herbs are great for kids. Like it's so simple, um, similar to what Rachel said, like teas are a great place to start, not necessarily adaptogenic herbs, but I have an 18 month old and we've been giving him like chamomile and fennel tea since when he was just like not even, not even eating real food and that really helped his digestion. Um, so it depends if they have specific things going on. Kids are so receptive and susceptible and they just don't need a, a big dose. So like working with somebody to just like kind of point you in the right direction is good. Um, I have like some, a couple formulas that I give parents to have on their shelves at home if their kids are fighting something or if somebody at school had a little cold or if they're just like sneezing and you want help or something to travel um so I don't know that I have any like really specific ones it kind of depends on your kiddo because different um temperament kids actually like don't respond well to some herbs but there's some great formulas I have um a bay area maker Erin I don't know if you also um carry this maker taproot medicine she's in Sebastopol but she has like a wellness syrup that's super kid friendly um I think there's molasses, honey and molasses in it. And then there's vinegar. So I also have this um, in my house and give it to my toddler when he's needing a little something. So, but you always want to do really small doses for kids and it depends on their age, what you do. So generally consulting with a practitioner is good just to like give you an outline. Thank you. Well, we are now um, out of time and this was great and really informative um, and thank you everyone for like, giving your insight as to what's happening and how you guys are helping yourselves uh, with stress. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, this is on Facebook and YouTube. I will send uh, all the panelists the link to it and feel free to share it with everyone that you know. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.